Last time we covered the history of Ferdinand Monlicker's first straight pull rifle. When France released the 1886 Labelle, Austria-Hungary had to play catch up. Luckily Monlicker had already solved the problem years ahead of time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Othias, and this, ooh, get her in shot, there we go, this long boy is the Repeater Gewehr Model 1895, the next wave in Monlicker straight pull rifles. Let's get it over the light box. At 50 and one half inch long, you'd expect this to be a hefty rifle, but it weighs in at only eight pounds, thanks to its slim and light build. It chambers the eight by 50 millimeter rimmed cartridge feeding five from an end block clip. Now, as lovely as this rifle is, I actually need to tuck it away because this is skipping pretty far ahead. Uh, remember from our last episode, because this is now part two of what's going to be three, guys, it's a big story to cover and there's a lot of details. Anyway, uh, last time we talked about all the way up to the 8890. So I just wanna review a few points on where that gun ended up before we go any further. The 1886 had been revolutionary, but it had been beat out by the French just because of their cartridge. And so they would stretch it into the 8890 model, which ultimately was still designed for black powder. I mean, yes, it could handle semi-smokeless at this point, but that locking action was fairly weak. Without a camming force, it lacked primary extraction strength. It also had no handguard, making it difficult to handle once it was heated up. As a matter of fact, we'll see a laced canvas cover take the place of the traditional wooden handguard in field use. Now these problems would ultimately kill the 8890 rifle, but they didn't affect the carbine because there was none. You notice, no 86 carbine, no 88, no 8890, None of these are compatible with a cavalry style weapon, which is what carbines really were at that time. And that's because of the oversized action uh, necessary to get that wedge locker to work and then the extra weight. We'll go into more detail in the next episode because that's when we're gonna do all of the straight pull short rifles and carbines at once. So there's basically gonna be a little jump in this episode. I just gotta hit the high notes so that we can make our way to the 95. I'm sorry guys, it's just the best way it's stacked visually to represent this to you. Anyway, <clears throat> you're talking about from 86, 88, 90, all these years that you're seeing these adoptions and changes with this straight pull long rifle and the cavalry, the pride of the ground forces, they are still carrying single shot Verndal carbines because that's the only thing that they could get that was light enough. Well, with all those issues combined, the Rifle Commission asked OWG directly if they had any solutions. Perhaps with some pride, Ferdinand Monlicker only had to dust off his original 1884 straight pull rotating lock system. With just a few changes, like moving the locking lugs up to the front and compressing the length of the whole thing, it was ready for trials. That testing would kick off in April of 1889. Oh, and I should say, by the way, just to clarify, he did develop an improved trigger mechanism as well. You will see that clearly in the animation. But anyway, it goes to trial and the focus is not on a new infantry rifle. It is on a cavalry carbine. So this is a high priority to get these horsemen back in business. There's already plenty of serviceable straight pull rifles out there for infantry. And then we can decide what we need to do about them down the road. We've got to flip flop this essentially. So with cavalry in mind, we're gonna see the adoption in December of 1890 of this handy little guy, a beautiful, smooth, wonderful little carbine. This is the Repeater Carabiner Model 1890. And we are not taking it to the light box because we're gonna see more of this guy in the next episode. It's just important that you know right now that he exists. So we'll just skip ahead to the introduction of yet another new rifle cartridge. And they'd place it back into the old 50 millimeter length case rather than the current 52. It was believed that this would aid in the combustion of the new propellant. Now, because this new cartridge headspaces, excuse me, 
off the rim, uh, that means that it's going to be compatible, despite that little difference, with the previous 8890 rifles, which is very important, as we'll find out, because by the time we get to the Great War, that gives us, like we learned from our last episode, 1.3 million extra guns that are still in service. Yes, I understand, we could have gotten a better cartridge that would be compatible with this new Model 90, as we'll find out with the 95, but... There's a sacrifice to that, and 1.3 million rifles in the middle of the Great War, this turned out to be a very, very smart decision. All right, let's take a moment and regroup, just like the Empire probably did. Let's take a look at what's happened here. We have, uh, since 1886 up to 1890, that is four years, we have adopted basically four rifles, and now that we are in the 93, we have now basically adopted four cartridges. These are a lot of big changes for the Empire. And so you have to make a decision about how many mixed arms and what sort of weapon system you want in your hands because uh, we have a straight pull that is okay. Uh, it's working okay with our ammo in terms of the long rifle. That's the 8890. And we had this wonderful 1890. And yes, in hindsight, we would like to have everybody have a version of this. But what is the cost there? Like. We, we've made all these quick decisions, now we're kind of gun-shy, pardon the pun. And so we don't want to keep making repeated changes and repeated mistakes, essentially, because every time we have to update these things again, it is very, very costly. So this is the time to sit back, take a deep breath, realize that you have enough weapons now that you're not in any immediate danger, they're modern enough. Let's just breathe, guys, and see what we really need. Now, that is a fine opinion to have if you don't know that a great war is on the horizon. And so, if you rest on this number of rifles, like a lot of empires, like the French did, then you'd be fine, you'd be set. But if you had sort of psychic vision, you would know, no, 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 we basically need an inventory and a half at a minimum to be prepared for this. And this is where it gets unusual because within two years of the new cartridge, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the one that's falling apart at the seams, the one that can't get together politically, and you guys know your history, and if you don't, go check out the Great War. This empire, in their discordant, unprepared military, somehow come up with the right solution again. Not just the right solution of the cartridge, but also they decide, no, 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 no. Things are shaky. We got a lot of people to keep under control. A war could break out. We might need extra weapons we're gonna need to go ahead and have extra reserve arms. And if we're going to have extra reserve arms, we need them to be the best possible ones. We are going with the 1890 system. So they go back to OWG and Monlicker and say, what can you do to turn this handy little carbine into a full-size infantry rifle and get rid of all these little hiccups that we have with the current one because we are doubling down and ordering more. And what he would come up with is what I already showed you, this 1895 long rifle. And there are some minor changes from the 1890. We're gonna explore that when I can compare the two in the next episode. So we're basically gonna go from what the 188890 looked like to talking about what this thing looks like. So let's get a closer look. All right, right away, uh, I wanna point out that in terms of usability, make sure you checked our previous episode because this doesn't change anything for the average soldier. Uh, it's still a straight pull. Um, and it's actually fairly easy to use. We'll talk about why they're harder later. Uh, we have our safety set on the left side, just like we did on the old 8890s. It's just more internalized. When we pop it over, and it's a little stiff, it's going to block the cocking piece from going forward and block the bolt handle from coming back. So, no bango. All right, now, oh, if we uh, look at our magazine system, it's also going to be the same, except for now we are using these cut out nice lovely clips, a little bit lighter, a little bit metal savings. Uh, again, load it all at once, last round in, falls out the bottom, no changes there. So if you're an Austro-Hungarian soldier, you are not surprised or confused by this rifle at all. And yet, it has some wonderful improvements. Now, before we get into the action, let's take a look at our improved 
flat ladder style rear sight. This is much less likely to snag or get in the way as that big bulky hard metal milled one. Um, it's graduated still in shrit, so let me get my patented plastic pokey hand. It'll run all the way up to 2600 shrit, which is going to have a notch at the very top for a very ambitious uh, volley fire situation. Now, working down the rest of the gun, we do have a full length handguard all the way to the other end where we find out that we have a stacking hook now on the side, or stacking rod, I should say, and we have our bayonet lug moved to the bottom. This was done because side mount bayonets were found to sort of deflect the shot a little bit, just to change that pressure right at the muzzle, and you'd rather have the muzzle pressure change underneath the gun on the vertical plane where you can adjust with the front sight settings when you set these guns up versus on the horizontal. All right, so oh, working our way back down, it's finally time to talk about this bolt, which as I retract, we'll see there's some major differences. We have a symmetrical front locking lug head with a big full length extractor not quite as good as the one on the Mauser 98, but very good compared to a lot of those out there. And it goes way down in this shaft as we'll see. All right, to get this guy out, we no longer have the release on the left. Instead, we get to the rear, roll our trigger forward and pull. And this guy is going to decock immediately. Some of them are a little more friendly and they'll stay extended. Now, if you have to put this back into the gun, you're going to want to manually grab these lugs twist and pull, I'll do that right now. And then luckily mine is a sweetheart and it will just stay like that. If yours won't, uh, you can fit an American dime right on in there and that will fit perfectly in the gap and help you get it set back into the rifle. Wonderful trick. Once it's down in these raceways, you can pop the dime out and you're good to go. All right, so I'm gonna tap this guy to get him to recompress so that we can go forward in the disassembly. So I'll just trick him into popping down. I'm gonna move this rifle out of our way. And then we'll see that disassembly of this bolt is actually more simple than the previous one. So uh, let's just get this guy, we're gonna pull our caulking piece back and then throw our safety on. That might be hard for you to see. Or I could throw my safety on before I get it back. All right, let's try this again. Yank back, safety on. There we go, okay? So see how I'm extended, safety's on. Now hold that safety down, spin this guy counterclockwise. So boop. Bloop, bloop, bloop. It's gonna keep funking away as it realigns on that notch. It takes a moment. So this is riveting uh, television for you guys again. Not that we'll ever end up on TV. All right, we're clear. You heard our firing pin drop, so try not to leave that where it's gonna chip on something. I, that's why I had my nice angle. Uh, this guy comes away. And then out the front, if we twist and pull, Twist and, sorry guys, it's so hard to do on this camera with my big mitts. Uh, twist and pull, twist and pull, twist and pull. It's a bit of a muscler. Ah. Okay, there we go. Extractor's free. Whoop. And with a big yank, we'll pull this guy free. So, uh, let me get my parts back into frame. There we go. This guy, uh, as you can maybe see, the grooves are now misaligned because I managed to twist it just enough trying to pull it out to keep it aligned. When you reassemble, let me get these grooves on this cap lined up right here. And if your grooves are aligned, it can be hard to see that there really is a cap right there. Now you're gonna wanna unscrew that, again, counterclockwise, but uh, you have to keep firm pressure on it because the spring is contained within. So my big mitts are gonna be in the way once again. So I'm just gonna keep some pressure on there and work that thing counterclockwise. Keep the pressure on there. No surprises. It's finely threaded, so you're gonna feel like you're at it for a little while, and then all of a sudden, katunk. All right, that guy's a little, seriously, keep the pressure on there, don't send that flying. All right, uh, as you can tell, we demoed this gun just yesterday, and I have not gotten into cleaning it yet. So, whoa, there's our spring, there's our firing pin, there's the lovely reaction of having a bunch of hand loads for the show all the time. And there is our bolt with its helical cuts. So we've got twin helix style cuts. These line up with something you cannot see, which is way down in there, which is a matching set of ribs so that, and by the way, getting this in the right direction is almost impossible in the first go. 
everybody, you got a 50-50 chance you'll mess it up. Um, but don't worry, you'll know you'll mess it up on like a Ross rifle. So uh, that's all. So if I push on one, the other one turns. That's the whole system. Beautiful, 90 degrees, and probably best seen by an animation, which we do have right here. We will still load up an end block clip. As a matter of fact, we have the magazine sorted from last episode, I am sure. So let's focus on that rotating bolt head. Note how the bolt sleeves helical ribs match grooves in the bolt body, twisting it 90 degrees into and out of lock. The safety is basically the same as the 8890, locking that cocking piece back and the bolt forward. Also note the redesigned and much more complicated trigger group. Otherwise, this is pretty simple. You guys can figure out the rest at a glance. So let's get it over to May for a demonstration. All right, this should look pretty familiar from the last episode. We'll load our end block. Take aim. And top boom. The safety should be familiar to any Austro Hungarian soldiers. Although, I like thumbing the caulking piece to make it a little easier. Alright, let's slow it down. How did I do on target? Not terrible, but I expected better. Back to Othias. I would thank May for that, but she made my hands real dirty. All right, so uh, this gun, just like the 8890, would be manufactured by both OWG Steyr and Feg Budapest. Although the markings will be a little bit clearer than those previous 8890s. We'll see a big old Steyr for OWG Steyr and a big old Budapest for FEG Budapest. Nice. The new 1895 rifle would be exported to the usual customers. You're gonna see some out to Thailand. You're gonna see some out to Greece, but the big, big buyer is gonna be Bulgaria and they are going to uniquely mark these rifles as their own. First, there would be the Bulgarian Lion on the crest. Next, we'll see a gas vent hole added to the bolt sleeve right up top. And finally, the Empire only marked the left side of their rear sights, whereas Bulgaria marked both sides. They would also be the first to use the Monlicker 1895 in battle during the first Balkan War against the Ottoman Empire. In this initial conflict, it would be pitted up against a number of early Mauser designs and an odd mix of single shot rifles and considering the combined Bulgarian, Greek, and Serbian victory, it must not have been all that bad. Unfortunately, the victors would fall to infighting over territory gained, and Bulgaria would be defeated by Greece and Serbia in the Second Balkan War. And truth be told, this isn't a perfect rifle. As a matter of fact, Mausers were being adopted all around the world and had some distinct advantages over the Monlicker. With the introduction of the stripper clip, they were nearly as fast to load, but were closed up, safe from debris. Plus, they could be topped up singularly, whereas the Monlicker clips had to be ejected. 
Now, another complaint that modern shooters like to uh, place on this gun versus the Mauser is that the bolts are extremely stiff. Um, I would like to dispel that because this guy is a World War I original, all matching, still fitted to itself, never been replaced or upgraded, and I find it to be extremely light and easy to use. So, there's a little snag, but otherwise, I'm not going to think that's all that much unusual compared to that initial oomph on the Mauser. So, not a fair comparison back in the day. Uh, future, yes, we'll get to that in a moment. Another thing that worried Austria-Hungary about this gun was something that they were proud of when it was first released, which is that they had used some superior metallurgic science to thin out their barrels and slim, slim down this whole front of the gun, which is honestly a big part of the weight savings on this thing. This is a very narrow gun. One of the first things you'll notice when you get a hold of one of these long rifles is just how slim and light it feels on this end. It leads to wonderful balance, but there was a big concern that it was going to be very easy to be deformed or damaged in combat, real hard combat. And so, with all these nervousness and little downsides working up, they would decide in 1914, early in 1914, that they were going to replace this rifle with a new and improved model. Now these trials boiled down to essentially four rifles. The first was a Mauser 98 Action set in a Mon Liquor style stock, chambering 8x50. The second was simply just an OWG made Mauser 1912 export model in 7x57. It's a rifle we'll actually cover in the series. The third was an M95 Mon Liquor Action paired with a Mauser flush box magazine with a fixed folding bayonet also chambering 7 by 57 millimeter. The fourth, and what many consider would have been the winner, was a modification of the Monlicker Schronauer rifle, chambering 792 by 57 millimeter. Of course, we will never know for sure what would have happened after this gun, because in 1914, another event happened to kick off. War were declared. There would be no new rifle. Instead, uh, FEG and OWG are going to crank it up to 11 on the production of these M95 rifles. Austro-Hungary was going to war with a gun they had already written off. The dual monarchy would start the war with roughly 850,000 of these guys, but by the end of it, they would produce just shy of 2,900,000 Monlicker M95 straight pull rifles. That is incredible. And uh, despite the fears about the barrel and the action and the dirt getting in here, these guys handle themselves pretty well. I mean, for their length, they're very light. Uh, this is kind of getting in that Carcano territory, although not nearly as simple and definitely much smoother of an operation, but you can hike up the mountain with these, not too bad. I mean, for a long rifle anyway, and they're very hardy. They're very accurate. They certainly were adaptable to glass and things like that. These were rugged, dependable guns. You just had to be careful to keep mud from packing up down here. But realistically, as much as people hate on this magazine system, you kind of got to try to really pack it in there. And granted, there's some trenches where that can happen, but there's a long way to go before you get to anything super vital, unless you just let it re-cake and re-cake and re-cake. So with any proper care, you're probably not going to have it fail right on the battlefield all of a sudden. Uh, anyway, these guys would work out pretty well for the Austro-Hungarians. In addition, like any other major arm, the 1895 would be captured and fielded by Entente forces like Italy, Russia, and Serbia. As we know, following the war, the Austro-Hungarian Empire would fracture and break apart. And what was left of it, that core of sort of Germanic Austrian peoples and the Hungarians, they are going to sign the Treaty of St. Germain, which in 1919 sets them up to have to pay back a lot of reparations. This is all sort of that Versailles mentality, and a big part of that is to hand over Gerns. So uh, they would do their best to hold on to their short 
rifles, which we will talk about in the next episode of why, uh, and turn a lot of these long boys over to people like Albania and Poland and things like that. Most of these nations, I'm not going to get into all of them because a lot of these people receive these. Most of those nations would trade them away in order to get more of what they wanted. So like German surplus, if that's what they had settled on as the Mauser. Okay. So you're staying with sort of your rifle and cartridge family. But there would be some people that would make use of these, uh, like the Italians, who would keep a lot in inventory all the way into World War II when they would be reissued to troops in Africa. Uh, and as a matter of fact, some of those rifles would then be captured by the British and sent over to India for training. Uh, you can spot an Italian-African uh, 1895 or 1895 short rifle or carbine by looking back here on the stock for a brand that says AOI. Czechoslovakia would actually produce a further run of not the long rifles, but actually a short rifle version. Again, next episode. They would do about 5,000 of them just to sort of catch up the last little bit of inventory because they were relying on these pretty heavily until the adoption of their VZ-24 Mauser. Plenty still remained in inventory though through World War II, so they would remain a reserve arm in, well, Czechoslovakia up until 38, and then go fold into Germany. Yugoslavia would receive a number of these and use theirs up until the adoption of their Mauser in 1924, and then began an ambitious rearsling program. They would convert the M95 long rifles into 7.92 by 57 millimeter short rifles with sights and handguards matching their Mausers. They would even modify the magazine to load from stripper clips, but that deserves a whole episode some other day. Both Austria and Hungary would keep their M95s in service all the way through World War II, essentially, but there's going to be some modification. And honestly, it's not that they preferred these guns over anything else. It's just that they're broke countries and they got tons of these things laying around. It's easier to just stick with, with, you, stick with what you know, and they do work. Okay, so more of an economics than a preference thing. As a matter of fact, Hungary would try to move away from the gun in the form of the 35M, but it never really reached significant numbers, not enough to displace this thing anyway. So uh, instead, you're gonna see around 1925, uh, Austria leads the way in trying to develop a cartridge that takes full advantage of the actual locking strength of this rifle and ignores how weak the previous 8890 was. In 1930, they would finally release what would be the eight by 56 millimeter Spitzer bulleted cartridge. Pushed up another 300 feet per second, this thing would have been real rough on one of those old wedge lockers. Since the length of the case was changed, it was an easy matter to ream the chambers of existing rifles for the update. A large S would be stamped over the chamber to denote the change. Hungary would follow, marking their chambers with an H, and Bulgaria would trail behind, also, like Austria, using the letter S. The designations for these particular conversions would vary depending on the country, although we generally recognize them as the 95 30 in the collector world. Now at the same time, most of the long guns would also be converted down to short rifles, but that again is being held over for the third episode. But overall, you're seeing the Monlicker M95 action serving these three nations, Bulgaria, Austria, and Hungary, all the way through World War II. Well, sort of, because as we know, there's a whole Anschluss and things like that, which means that they get added like Czechoslovakia to the German inventory. As a matter of fact, it's not uncommon to find photos of German soldiers with these guys as well. All right, with all that wrapped up, let's go ahead and get this thing over to May and get her opinion on this beautiful long rifle. Once again, we've made room for May and for this M95 long rifle. Would you put that thing away, please? Thank you. We're talking about this one now. I understand you like it. We did a whole episode that they've just watched about this. Pretty cool. All right, anyway. This is the 1895 straight pull Monlicker, not the 86 or the 8890. Do you want me to give you the gun or not? Yes, please. Okay. Would you walk us through the ergonomics? <laughs> All right. First things first. Thias hands me this gun on range. Oh my goodness, there is such a difference in the weight and the length in this gun. It's, well, it's drastically different. What is this, like, dwarf magic they made it this light? This is impressive. I thoroughly appreciate that, guys. Um, but no, seriously, like, it was definitely unexpected, even having that much length for it to be that 
weightless it was or that much less weight that was just impressive and it's actually really thin too which was super nice it's got like a bit of elegance to it, it i almost feel like it's supposed to be delicate with how elegant it is but it isn't it's it's pretty stout i was very impressed um, they actually even like made the magazine protrude a little bit less, which I appreciate. It still sticks out. Don't get me wrong. You can still potentially see it being a problem when marching with it, but I would actually have an easier time marching with this one now. It, I feel like it wouldn't bang me up quite as bad. And then the wrist, it's much thinner and I appreciate they still kept that semi pistol grip, which I am able to now fit my full hand around showing the camera. And it is super comfortable. It really tucks your hand up in there behind the trigger, which I thoroughly appreciate. This was actually a much more comfortable position for me. Um, now the action, uh, the, it is a little bit different this time around because it's actually much stiffer, especially for the pull through. And it kind of wants to almost like stick. So it's, it's definitely not as smooth at A6. Now I know it was an improvement because it does extract better. However, it, it just doesn't want to like be quite as easy for the pull and push through. It does want to stick here and there. So just, just not my favorite, I guess, but thank you for at least improving that guys. Now for the safety, that one is super stiff to one hand. I almost like to actually thumb the caulking piece back a little bit and push the safety on. It's actually super easy when you pull it back just a little bit. However, one handing on and off, it's a little difficult. So. Eh, not my favorite, but ergonomically, I can see like just improvements overall. Also, want to point out these sights, way more flush. That's that's super comfortable, and the wood goes all the way up to the top, so that I don't have to touch a hot barrel at any point. Yeah, they definitely really thought about it, making a lot of improvements to the 86 with this gun. I can see it. All right, there's some enthusiasm there, and I do, may I borrow that? Sure. I do have to agree with the uh, elegance issue because. <sighs> You see it on camera, you see it in photos, and you think, you know, it's a fairly pretty gun. A lot of people get distracted by the mag, but I tell you what, if you're looking at a photo of this gun, cover up the mag with your thumb or something so you're not seeing it. Look at the rest of it. It's svelte. It's lovely. And it's hard to see, but when you get your hands on one, and I, I suggest you do, they're just perfect. I don't know how to explain it. The, the wrist is just the right size. The stock is very narrow. It just feels so balanced and beautiful. Uh, it's just, it's a kinesthetic joy just to put your hands on this thing. Um, elegant, again, the absolute right word. But remember, these factors kind of made the authorities nervous. They thought this wasn't going to hold up to a real knockdown, drag out war. So we're gonna need to know how it did when you got a chance to finally fire that rifle. So starting out first, of course, with the sights, as I mentioned before, they're flush to the gun, which is nice. There's not a lot of like stuff going on up top to block my vision. So I've got all of my peripheral vision, which is important. And I want to point out this V-notch, while not being any deeper, it's still medium range. It was still pretty decent to see through. So for me, already not having all this mess up top, bump the sights up to an eight or nine in my opinion. So good job guys. I appreciate the improvements. Now for the trigger. This trigger on this one I actually thought was a little bit worse than the 86 because it feels like there's absolutely no weight at first. It's a long take up and then all of a sudden it gets heavy, a little mushy, a little mushy heaviness to it and break. You actually can anticipate the break with this one. Now me, I'm a practice shooter at this point so I'm able to work around it and able to fire with it well on range. However, I could see someone having trouble flinching with this one because they would actually know when the break was coming. So just be careful around that guys. Just not as good a trigger as the 86 in my opinion. The recoil I will say was actually a little bit worse. It was a little bit snappier because there just isn't as much weight, um, I guess, mitigating that recoil. Whereas before I had all that weight keeping it um, from coming back as sharp into my shoulder, which I appreciated. But I will say, that the thin wrist on this one actually did help me to mitigate some of the recoil, however, because I was able to just get my hand up in there, pull it deeper into my shoulder. So the recoil I felt was still very manageable. It was still pretty decent. So overall as a shooter, it still performed well. Not my favorite trigger, but it was still fairly decent. These guys really do perform pretty well on range. Uh, may I borrow that? Sure. 
Now, uh, a lot of you though have probably shot one converted to 8x56 like we talked about earlier, and you'll notice that there is one little issue, which is that the butt plate down here is kind of rounded out, and it has the ability to really get kind of sharp on that shoulder if there's too much recoil. Now, an 8x50, if you haven't had a chance to shoot the original World War I style cartridge, I recommend it because it feels much gentler out of this gun. I have uh, shot the long rifle in the 8x56, as has May, and it's a little more punishing. Uh, it tends to be a lot sharper, it tends to really point out the deficiency of this buttstock shape back here, which you don't notice as much with the 8x50. Uh, but anyway, I guess that sort of leads us up to the obvious question of would you or would you not, here, let me give that back to you. Sure. Take that, the M95, into the Great War with confidence. All right, so the action was a little bit stiff and the trigger wasn't my favorite. And honestly, I could see how using this in a trench, I would wind up turning around and clubbing the guy before I actually had a chance to shoot him. So maybe in that scenario, not the best. However, if you've told me that I've got to go climb that mountain to go shoot at some Italians on the other mountain, I think this one would actually perform, it would do well because it's so light and I can just easily carry it up there and it's got long range so I wouldn't have any difficulty shooting at the other mountain, presumably. Um, I'd have to actually try that out sometime. But no, yeah, honestly, this would be a great one to take into battle for that scenario, for this situation. So yeah, I would give this one a decent yes. Yeah, the Italians had so much trouble with this rifle that the song you heard earlier was actually sung by them about this. So check for it in the description if you want to know more about that. All right, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. So uh, just a reminder, check the updates because we have a lot going on. And otherwise, thank you once again for tuning on in. Later, guys. Alright, just some quick updates, and I'm sorry for the lack of video, but May has me running around the house chasing a pig. Literally a pig. Uh, anyway, posters are killing it. Thank you, everyone. And if you're watching this much later, I'm sorry for the confusion. Uh, share those, please. Please, we need the help. Uh, otherwise, I want to make sure that I take a step back and really address why the Patreon people are so important to the show. Because, you know, I get people that want to make singular donations, and I appreciate those. I do. But I would rather have $12 at $1 a month for a year, you know, instead of a single $20 payment. And it's because that $1 getting stacked with all the others means that I have a budget that I know is coming up at the beginning of every month. And I can plan for it. I can say things like, okay, I want to go in December to do this. We'll see about this much money come through, yada, yada. It levels production so much better than lump payments. Now, if somebody's going to drop thousands of dollars, which hasn't happened, but if they did, okay, that's a big lump that we can work with. Although I'm not sure I could even accept that. But anyway, that's, you know, that's different. But if it's 20, 30 bucks at a time, it's very welcome, but it's hard to sort of plan for. And it just sort of gets rolled in the snowball for further down the line instead of being immediately useful. So, um, yeah, that's it, guys. I just really want to say again, thanks for the patrons because, yes, the money helps, but also the stability is really helping us drive the show in a much stronger direction. All right, bye.